There are many, many sad situations that we see in the world of medicine. I'm Dr. David DeRose, a specialist in internal medicine and preventive medicine. And it always strikes me as especially tragic when you see a person late in life who really physically seems to be in really very good health. They may not have heart disease. They may never have had cancer. Their lungs may be functioning great. They may be able to walk long distances. But if they don't have their cognitive faculties, it is just a sad, sad scenario. The big question today is, might there be a missing link when it comes to preventing dementia? I actually think there is. And I think one of the things that we don't really talk much about has to do with blood fluidity. You may have heard me use the term before, hemorrheology. That's the technical scientific term for this science of blood fluidity. I prefer to call it the Methuselah factor because Methuselah, reportedly the longest man to have ever lived on the planet, no doubt had a lot going for him, but he must have had good blood fluidity. With, with that in mind, let's just talk briefly about some of the research looking at blood fluidity indicators and mental performance. If you measure blood viscosity, that's a measure of blood fluidity, what we find is as viscosity rises, if you will, the blood is getting thicker. As that happens, as that goes up, mental performance deteriorates. And this is not just true as we get older, it's true when we're younger as well. Another marker of blood fluidity is hematocrit. Hematocrit is the percentage of blood that is made up of red blood cells. So in other words, if I draw a pint of your blood, we spin it down, we say, how much is red blood cells? If 45% of your blood is made up of red blood cells, that means your hematocrit is 45%. Now, we do need blood cells in, air, in order to carry oxygen and have clear mental functioning. I mean, if you're profoundly anemic, if your hemoglobin is four, that's really bad. Your hematocrit might only be 12 or 15. This is not good. You're not gonna have good mental functioning because you can't get the oxygen you need to the brain. But once you get that hematocrit adequate, raising it higher doesn't improve brain function, it worsens it because your hemorrheology, your blood fluidity worsens. So here's the missing link, at least from my vantage point, when it comes to preventing dementia. It's honing in on the importance of blood fluidity. Make your blood more fluid, the evidence indicates, regardless of your age, regardless of whether you have signs of dementia or not, and your brain performance will improve. Good news for students, good news for people early in their work life career, good news for people later in life, and especially good news when we're trying to keep all our faculties later in life. But you say, okay, well enough and good. Improve my blood fluidity, but just how do I do it? There's all kinds of strategies we could talk about. In fact, I have video series and books that deal with this topic. In my book, The Methuselah Factor, we give a 30-day plan for improving blood fluidity. Every day, a short chapter, that's your reading assignment, and then you put those practices into place in your own life. If you do that, they're calculated to improve your blood fluidity. But let me give you just one of them today that can help you as far as your brain functioning. It's avoiding hidden sugars. That's right. Hidden sugars seem to be all around us. And if you look at the research, the most surprising source of the worst amount of sugar in the diet is not anything that we eat. A lot of people say, well, how could that be? How could it be in my diet, but I'm not eating it? It's because you're drinking it. Sugar-sweetened beverages really take up the lion's share of the excess sugar that is being consumed in America today. If you want to decrease your sugar consumption, look no further than the beverage aisle. Substitute water for sugar-sweetened beverages, for soft drinks and other drinks, and you'll be dramatically decreasing your sugar intake, which in turn will help your blood fluidity. You may say, well, what's that connection? How does sugar intake affect blood fluidity? One of the ways it does is because when we use simple sugars, when we eat them or drink them, 
are triglycerides. A blood fat tends to rise. As triglycerides go up, blood fluidity goes down. Fascinating study some years ago, they looked at individuals who had trouble with brain function. They were older, maybe some blockage in the blood vessels. As the triglyceride levels went up, brain function went down. Just another connection between sugar, the tendency to raise triglycerides, and then how triglycerides affect brain performance. You say, but Dr. DeRose, I've gotten rid of the sugar-sweetened beverages, and I'm just eating good foods. I eat a lot of organic foods, maybe. Well, just because something's organic doesn't mean you're not getting a lot of organic cane sugar or organic beet sugar. How can you tell if a food you're eating is high in sugar or not? In my book, I recommend a simple calculation. Look at the nutrition facts label. Take the total carbohydrates and divide it by the simple sugars. If that figure is five or greater, that means you've got a lot more carbohydrates, complex carbohydrates, than the simple sugars, and that's a reasonably low sugar food. If that number is four or three or two or one, one would mean basically the entire carbohydrate content is simple sugar. You're talking about foods that are sugar rich. They're calculated to do what? Calculated to raise your triglycerides. As triglycerides go up, blood fluidity goes down, and brain performance suffers. Have you got it? A missing link to preventing dementia? A missing link to better brain performance? May lie no further than improving your blood fluidity. One way to do it, avoid hidden sugars. I'm Dr. David DeRose.